Today, I am delighted to host this talk by our very special guest, Glacio Pessoa, who will be discussing an engaging theme, Jesus Walks on Water, Harnessing the Power of Trust. Before proceeding with today's talk, I would like to take a quick moment for a friendly reminder to please send in your questions for this morning's presentation using the chat window. Glossio has reserved time to address your comments and questions uh, once he concludes his presentation today. Now, we are looking forward to an engaging time with our speaker, Glossio Pessoa. He has been active in the spiritist movement for over 37 years and currently serves as vice president of the Christian Spiritist Community of Atlanta. He has a special interest in spiritist activities revolving around media, English translation, and music. Glacio holds master's degrees in both business administration and electrical engineering, and currently works in data protection and compliance. This morning, Glacio will speak to the theme of Jesus Walks on the Water, Harnessing the Power of Trust. The narrative, which is found in the writings of John and Mark, portrays one of Jesus' most memorable miracles. However, it also exemplifies how confidence takes us to higher levels. We must have faith in the divine recourse and planning. We must also trust ourselves and those around us, regardless of how tormentous our lives might be. We are never alone. Please give a warm welcome to our dear brother, Glossio. Thank you, Brad. Uh, I also like to, to thank my, my friends from the US Spiritist Federation for uh, giving me this opportunity to discuss with you this very interesting passage. And in the introduction, uh, it is also, it is not only in Mark and John, but also in Matthew. I, uh, I should have, uh, when I sent the text, uh, I should have uh, mentioned Matthew as well. And that's exactly the, the, uh, the passage I'm going to read right now. It's in Matthew chapter 14, uh, uh, verses 22 and 33. So basically, basically it goes like this. So immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. An interesting point about this passage is that it is right after the multiplication of the bread and the fish. So as we recall, uh, Jesus uh, provided us what uh, was described as a miracle, uh, the multiplication of, of, uh, of resources to feed a very large crowd uh, that was following him. So right after that, he dismissed the, the crowd and uh, he asked his disciples to get on the boat to cross. They would be crossing to Gennesaret where there are several uh, um, recorded miracles. Now moving on to verse 23. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were ter terrified and said, it is a ghost. And they cried out of in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when he got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, 
truly you are the son of God. Again, this is in Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 and 33. And the same passage can be found in Mark chapter 6, verses 44, 45 through 52. And John chapter 6, verses 16 through 21. I'd like to, to first of all, point out to some... Uh, to some geographical uh, geographical aspects of, of this, uh, the, the, uh, pretty much so that I can, can paint the scenario to you. So I'd like to, to refer to uh, an interesting slide that I have that depicts uh, the lake where it happened. Actually, it, at that time, it was called the Sea of Galilee. So even though uh, we, in our minds, it is, uh, we can think of it as a lake, but it, it was quite extense. Um, it is called it's called the Sea of Galilee. Um, it was also called Lake Tiberias, and later on, it was known as the Lake of Gennesaret because again, there were very several miracles that happened in Gennesaret. So it is not just any ordinary lake. It is the surface is sixty four square miles, so it's, it's quite extensive. The maximum depth is 157 feet and um, extends uh, on the longest. If you look at the longest, longest axis, it is 13 miles long and um, north and, between north and south and the maximum of seven miles east and west. So it is not, we're not talking about a little lake that you can cross uh, just by rowing. It is quite, uh, it is by Though, you know, by the stand, even by today's standards, it is quite large. And by the way, um, the lake, um, the River Jordan is one of the tributaries to the Sea of Galilee. So when we think about the whole scenario, now we, we can have a, a better understanding of what the, the situation that the disciples uh, were in. So, uh, so as we can see here in the beginning of the passage, it was not dark yet uh, right after when when uh, uh, after Jesus dismissed the crowd and asked uh, his disciples to get on the boat it wasn't it wasn't dark yet so you might say that it was uh, around dusk so you could imagine that it was probably around between five uh, give or take between five and six o'clock maybe maybe around five between four and five so it wasn't uh, it was it was not getting, it wasn't dark yet. Now, what we see here is that uh, he, as he was, by the time he was, you know, when we went to the mountain to pray, the boat of this mount at uh, this time was a long way from the land. So we, we can say that the boat was a few miles from land. Now, uh, two details here, it was beaten by the waves and the wind was against them. So I, you might envision it as, as a small sailboat, a small fisherman boat, and uh, the, the, the weather was not very helpful. And most importantly, he, the disciples are in trouble. Something is, something is gone wrong. Now you're in the middle of a lake, you're, you're a few miles away from the shore, and we're talking about a lake, you know, again, it's not some, it's not one of those situations in which you can just get out of the boat and then swim to the shore. We're talking about a, 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 a sea that has a, a depth of around, you know, a, a maximum depth of 147 feet. So it's, it's quite, uh, they were kind of, kind of a big predicament. And another thing also, uh, when Jesus, when they, they see Jesus, it was in the fourth watch. This is a Roman uh, time segment. Uh, Romans, they had the, the divided the night in four watches. And uh, basically the first watch would be something between six and nine. Second watch between uh, nine and midnight. Third watch somewhere between midnight and 3 a.m. The fourth watch is between 3 a.m., and 6 a.m. in the morning. So this tells us that the disciples had been battling the, the waves. They have been struggling 
to cross to the other side for several several hours. Now, imagine now by today's standards, uh, it would have been a very scary experience. Now, just imagine how it would have been 2,000 years ago. It must have been a very dangerous situation. So we see here uh, that they were definitely, you would imagine, right, that they were scared. Uh, they were tired. Uh, maybe hungry, distraught, extremely stressed out. And to add to their confusion, they see a figure that approaches them walking on water. And uh, that just, that initially, that does not help them much. They are actually, that adds to their, adds to, uh, to their concerns. Initially, they believe that Jesus is a ghost. They believe that initially there was a, a, an apparition. And in the culture of the time, seeing a ghost was... Now we understand that we, if we see a ghost, if we see a disincarnate experience, a disincarnate spirit, it is a normal phenomena. It's a normal experience. However, back then, it was a sign of bad luck. So they were very exasperated when they imagined that they were seeing a ghost uh, walking towards them. They thought, that, hey, I mean, uh, things are so bad. Things are not going to get any better now. So speaking of, of which, right, speaking of the, the quote-unquote miracle, uh, Kardec explains, uh, offers an explanation to it. Uh, in the book of Genesis, when in chapter 14, when he talks about fluids and explanation of uh, some of the facts that uh, we sometimes see as supernatural, in item 43, he explains that um, whenever we see a table get, getting detached from the ground and floating, it apparently has not support, no support by physical eyes or support by physical means the way we understand it. So the spirits, of course, they do not have a, an arm. They do not have a physical body. However, the way they perform that phenomena is they envelop and they penetrate that with, with, with fluids. And by fluids, mean by energy, by, um, by uh, uh, matter that is uh, quasi-material. So by doing that, they neutralize the effect of gravity. And by neutralizing the effect of gravity, they allow it to float. And Kardec uses an analogy, Kardec mentions, as the air does for balloons and kites. So kind of like it is not saying that, hey, it is the same principle of uh, that we would see the same principle of hydrodynamics, in, in which case if we fill up uh, uh, a balloon with a hot air, you reduce the density of that object and it floats. It's not saying that. That's not what Kardec is saying. Kardec is just using it as an analogy for that. So basically, we, we see here that the same way, right, the same way that I could do uh, that spirits can move objects, the spirit, spirits can make objects tap. And Kardec and others at the time study it uh, um, very extensively. So we see here that we're not talking about a phenomenon. We're not talking about something supernatural. We're talking about laws of, um, uh, I should say, laws of the universe that we still comprehend very little of. So the same way, so it's the same principle that you use to move an object, to lift an object, that could be applied to a, a, an individual as well. Now, Kardec expands on that. Now, that was chapter 14. Now, Kardec expands on that in chapter 14, 15, I'm sorry, when he talks about the miracles of the gospel. And again, there is a section, a specific section, um, 
where he deals with how Jesus was able to walk on water. And pretty much, again, he, he refers back uh, to the phenomenon, to the, to the principles, I should say, that he had uh, alluded to in chapter 14, um, item 43. And what he emphasizes is like, hey, again, this is, uh, um, things are miraculous to us. Things are supernatural when we don't understand. Um, nothing is supernatural. Things are natural. Things are part of nature. It's just that um, to us, when we don't understand something, we think those are supernatural. When we don't understand uh, what happens in our lives, when we sometimes we don't understand some of our struggles, some situations, we, we face situations in which you think, oh my God, why is this happening to me? This is so uh, unbelievable, so unreal. And to us, we see those as uh, unnatural, unjust, and it's because we don't understand the whole, uh, the whole of the situation. We don't understand the whole, um, the master plan, how, you know, so to speak. So similarly, this, this, this phenomenon to us appeared to be supernatural at the time because we had little, we had no understanding. Now we have some understanding of those phenomena. So now we can see that pretty much they, um, uh, they're part of nature. Interestingly enough, uh, enough, Kardec explains what happened how actually Kardec offers two explanations of how Jesus was able to, to perform the, that particular feat, uh, the particular uh, uh, phenomenon. First of all, uh, he mentions, uh, he alludes to what would be a projection uh, of Jesus. Jesus projected himself and appears upon the water in a tangible form. And Kardec is more convinced that that would have been the case. Um, and he, he refers to tangible, uh, the chapter on tangible apparitions, again, uh, in chapter 14, items uh, 35 and 37. Another explanation is that, again, that this, the, Jesus was able to, to float on water the same way that spirits are able to to um to move uh, to move objects using fluidic force so again jesus had you know when we're talking about a spirit that is perfect like jesus uh, that spirit has an understanding has sufficient understanding of laws of the universe and and again laws that to us do not seem that we still don't understand and um, and he performed the, the he induces the phenomena in both himself and in Peter. Now, on the other hand, Peter was, of course, Peter being Peter being Peter being still not a perfect spirit, a spirit like us who is evolving. He gets he doesn't understand, and, and um, he is unable to take part in the process because, quote unquote, he gets scared of the rough, rough winds. Uh, in other words, he kind of loses focus and uh, on Jesus, and he forgets to uh, about the trust that he had in his master. And this is a very interesting point. Uh, the whole, um, in, in, the, the, in the Bible, we see all these little details, and we see, hey, he got scared of the rough, rough winds. And it's something that I will allude to a little bit later. So when we talk about faith, when we talk about trust, there are three different, three, there are different, three different categories that, uh, in which we can exercise our trust or our faith. First of all, we can exercise our trust in the divine. We should exercise our trust in ourselves. And um, last but not least, we should also trust others. When we see here in the gospel according to Spiritism, when we refer to chapter 19, Kardec uh, talks about faith that transports mountains, the power of faith. He, he mentions uh, faith, he, he categorizes faith as divine inspiration that awakens uh, noble instincts 
and pretty much they they lead us to goodness and it, they he calls it uh, um, Kardec classifies it as a base of all regeneration so we see here whenever we have faith in uh, again faith in the divine trust in the divine we are pointing we are focusing on something that is higher than us high something that inspire us to do something amazing something that inspire us to uh to believe that there are forces uh in our lives there are forces that uh, and there are quote unquote phenomena there are quote unquote facts that could be miraculous to us but actually they are part of this whole master plan of the universe and interesting also in this, uh, this um, in this, like, his explanation, Kardec also mentions that it is this space has to be strong and durable. So you have to to if you don't have doubt, then it causes you to shake, and um, you know that that whole foundation that you have it, it tumbles. We we spend time studying about um, about the the gospel. Um, of course, you know, I'm a spiritist. This is a spiritist lecture, but the, regardless uh, of one's belief, we all we all study about good things. But sh we should keep in mind that we have to put it in practice. We have to make it part of our lives. We cannot be a different person, uh, a different person at the center uh, than somebody who we are in real life. Our faith has to be unshakable, has to be, has to be the foundation of our actions. And Kardec also adds to it, um, mentioning that the, the faith has to be stronger than the so sophisms and the mockery of the incredulous. So, so that it, um, if it cannot do that, then it is not true faith. In other words, our, it's all about our values. Our values, they have to be strong. Our values, they have to be what they are, regardless of the opinion of others, regardless of quote-unquote social norms. And by social norms, I'm not talking about the culture of a whole, of, of a whole nation. I'm talking about the, those little social norms of, of the, the little niches, the small niches that are of people, of individuals that are part of our lives. Uh, of course, beginning with our families, and then expanding it to our circle of friends and, and our workplaces uh, as well. So what is it that we manifest ourselves in society, those small niches? That's uh, those, those uh, rules uh, we have to live in, in those. We have to be, um, the, the law of society is a law of nature. So we do have to be part of society. However, we should live by our values regardless of where we are. A very important uh, point here is that uh, faith is the mother of all virtues that lead, uh, lead to God, according to Kardec as well. And pretty much they bring us hope and they inspire us for charity. So they bring us hope again, because as we believe that there is something above us, that there is something better than us, that there is something perfect that is taking care of us. So we got we, we to understand, you know, that gives us hope of something better. That gives us hope that we can be something better than we are, that we, we can be our, uh, we can be always become a better version of ourselves. And with that, we see the whole, um, the whole premise of charity. If I can, um, if I have to become a better person, if I have to be better, I have to express that in, um, in actions. And there's a whole debate uh, from different uh, different doctrines and different beliefs that uh, some profess that faith alone should, should be sufficient. And a true study of the teachings, even the, the and there's a lot of references to Paul when Paul mentions that, hey, faith is, is all you need. And, and uh, apparently, however, it, a true study of even what Paul mentions uh, of, of the teachings of Paul reveals to us that, hey, um, faith is very important. Faith inspires us. But the, the what truly matters is what, what do I do next? I have the, there are the, the works of God in the universe. God has 
put the whole universe for us. He created all the laws that govern everything that happens around us. Um, there are also the moral laws that guide how we should act. But uh, above and beyond, there's also my own initiative, my own also own, what is it that I'm doing to make both myself a, a better individual and also make those around me uh, be in a better position as well. So we see here again that um, the again referring back to the gospel, uh, there is the, the the power of faith that can be manifested itself in the magnetic action as well. So again, we see the power of faith in the the phenomena described in the passage, but also we see how we can use the faith to to act on the fluids act on the universal agent and we modify and, uh, and giving them impulsion. So we see the power, we talk about the power of prayer, uh, of being able to send this positive energy, uh, of being able to change the, the uh, to change again, the, the universe, this universal agent that we have, uh, that we call fluids, uh, the universal fluid, the, 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 the primary principle. So how is it that we can change it again if we have faith, if we have this positive mind, if we are believing that there is always something, there is goodness, that we believe in the divine, then we can, it gives us the willpower to direct that energy towards goodness. And a lot of times um, we, see the, we see how much healing that can provide to us, how much well-being that can uh, um that can create and sometimes situations that could be classified as miracles because they're so extraordinary. We see uh, extraordinary people sometimes uh, helping others, sometimes uh, motivating others in an, uh, in an extraordinary way. Again, it is, the, it is the, the faith in something better. It is, again, the, the projection of that positive energy. And we see here uh, in the narrative of Matthew, again, going back to, to Matthew chapter 17, uh, 14, uh, verses 14 and, and 20, uh, when the apostles, they try to, uh, to cure uh, the lunatic son that was referred to them. They could not help uh, the, the child. However, Jesus was able to cure and then he mentions, he, he chastises them for, them for the lack of of faith so pretty much again not being able to to have a faith in something divine um not have enough uh, uh be able to have a faith that in, that the, the possibility of uh, of transferring this positive energy um and uh to us after all this uh all these years right uh, throughout all these incarnations it is all the incarnations we've been through to us it is still something new sometimes. It's still sometimes a, a miracle or sometimes a new uh, experience for all of us. And um, in a sense, that's what happens, uh, going back to Peter, that's what happens to him. He was able to initially uh, be part of the phenomena. Of course, uh, Jesus was, uh, was creating all the conditions for him to be floating above water. However, at the moment, at, at a very special moment that is, that is uh, mentioned in the passage, he loses faith. And the moment he loses faith is when he loses his focus on Jesus, is when he forgets about the divine intervention, about, uh, about um, his master, right his mentor and he forgets about that and what is it that he focus he focus on the rough winds he focus on the negative he focus on the problem so instead of focusing on the solution instead of focusing on the fact that wow i mean this is incredible i'm i'm floating uh on water here he focus on on something that was um, on the, that was something that was detrimental he, he, in his problems, in his situations, and that's like and it is a, a common theme in our in our experiences, because a lot of times we're so concerned about our 
problems. We're so engrossed in, into our difficulties and, and, and uh, all the disturbances that are around us. And sometimes we're so focused on the rough winds and, uh, and the strong winds and on the rough seas that's around us that we forget that there are divine forces available to assist us. Sometimes we're so exasperated. Sometimes we're so distressed that we forget to pray. We forget to ask for help. We forget to, to connect uh, to our spiritual friends who are all around us and who are trying to, uh, to, to help us, but they, they all need a chance. Sometimes we have these friends who are trying to speak to us. They're trying to inspire us. They're trying to, to to fill us up with positive energy, but it's just that again, we're so negative. Um, we're not listening to them. We're, we are not paying attention to them. A very interesting point towards the end of the passage is that when, when Peter falls into the water, he asks for help. And the moment he asks for help, Jesus was right there to help him. Again, goes back to the whole to our own experiences uh, in our lives, and in the crucial moments, that's when we remember to ask for help. Sometimes things so get so difficult, or sometimes we allow things to get become so difficult that that is when we finally finally remember to ask for help, to ask God to assist us, to ask Jesus to assist us. To ask our, our spiritual guide, our spiritual mentor to, to assist or, or our spiritual friends. And when that happens, the help comes immediately. So again, that's very important, uh, a very important uh, aspect of the passage. Now, there was trust in the divine, but another important uh, point here is the, the, the term of, of faith in, in us. The, the faith in the realization of something and in a, in a particular end, because a very important point, and we see that in this particular passage, Jesus does ask, uh, Jesus does not go to, um, not immediately, he does not go to Peter. Peter, he, Peter has the, the chance to walk to Jesus. So we see this uh, throughout the gospel, we see this, this uh, whole concept that, hey, um, Jesus is going to come to you or he's going to at least make himself available to you. But um, bottom line, it's going to be up to you to walk to him. So we see here in this particular, in this particular passage, um, we see that in the passage of the blind man uh, of Jericho, we see that, again, the blind man of Jericho, he had to... To the, the moment he saw that Jesus was around, he, he had to, to shout, right? He had to yell to read Jesus. He had to, to, um, uh, he had to stand up, throw away his tunic, and go walk to Jesus. Uh, we see that uh, with Lazarus as well. Remember, in, in the case of Lazarus, uh, Jesus asked that they remove the stone, right? They asked that they, Jesus asked that the stone be removed. He asked that all the bandages be removed from Lazarus. But after this point, he did not say, "Hey, you know, please, uh, uh, please lift uh, uh, Lazarus up." What he says now at this point, he orders Lazarus to stand up and walk, right? So we see this uh, this point. You have to, you need to have faith in the divine because again, the divine uh, divine intervention is going to help us by removing any rocks that are blocking our way, by uh, by removing any bandages that might be tying up anything that might be slowing us up, uh, slowing us down. I'm sorry, but uh, but also there's there's our initiative as well, and we see that in our in our uh, evolutionary evolutionary path. Nobody's going to evolve for us. We can ask Jesus to help us and inspire us. But again, it is going to be up to us to do our part. We have to do, again, going back to the story of Lazarus, we have to uh, 
it's not going to be up to us to stand up and walk on our own two feet. And we see here that, again, that, that this, this faith that is the confidence of something, in this case, the confidence in us, and, um, and uh, not only in our, in our abilities to do great things on, by earthly standards, because all of us are very capable of doing great things on earth, but also especially doing great things with ourselves, great, doing great things as spirits. And, and uh, this, uh, this gives us another perspective. Uh, this gives us a perspective of positivity, positivity, of trusting us, trusting us despite our shortcomings, but having this, uh, having this, uh, this focus on what I can get to uh, a very uh, a passage, not so much, uh, uh, a passage in a book that I, I find it very interesting. Everybody, I'm pretty sure everybody is familiar with the book Alice in Wonderland. And um, so Alice, she is at a, she is, of course, she, she's lost, right? She's in a different country. And she comes, um, she comes to a point in which there is a, a bifurcation in the world. Basically, basically, the world splits up in two ways. And she's confused because she doesn't know which which one of the paths she will choose. And then all of a sudden, the sudden the chess heart, uh, cat appears and asks her, "Hey, what's going on, Alice?" And she says, "I don't know which path to choose." And then the chess heart cat uh, tells her, "Hey, uh, where do you want to go to?" And she says, "I don't know." And then the cat tells her, "Well, then it doesn't matter." Which, which path you choose. So it's kind of interesting uh, when we don't have these, uh, when we don't have a focus in the future, when we don't have objectives, it doesn't matter which way we go. So having this faith in the future, having this faith in a better situation for us, in a better, uh, for, especially from the spiritual standpoint, that gives us this clarity, that gives us a better way for us to choose our paths, right? The same way that Alice, she need to know which way to go uh, to choose the right path, right? The same way we have to, to have a, a clear, in our clear mind, we have to have this focus on the spiritual, this focus on something that is better than us or, or of, uh, a faith that one, one day we can be better so that we can make the better choices. Speaking of, of making choices, also Kardec reminds us that whenever we have faith in ourselves, we are calm. It gives us patience that allows us to wait, because especially because we understand in our minds why. Especially we understand that uh, why is it that I believe? Why is it that I believe that there is reincarnation? And why is it that I believe that I'm a spiritual soul? Why is it that I believe that there's a God who is the, the supreme intelligence, the primary cause of everything? So, so having this, this kind of faith, in, 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 especially this faith that not only inspires us, but opens our minds, our minds also gives us a, a calm. Um, and Kardec also reminds us that, uh, on the other hand, when we don't have this faith, then we fall in our own weaknesses. Um, and we don't have, um, we don't have the, we're, we tend to be insecure and a lot of times act with violence. A lot of times do things that do not, that goes, uh, go again, goes against our values. And pretty much, uh, on the other hand, whenever we stay calm, at least try to stay calm, it, it means that we are stronger and we are, we're in a path of becoming more confident from a spiritual standpoint. Going back to the passage and going back to, to Peter, we, we say here, we see this, uh, this picture of Peter as somebody who has, uh, who's lacking faith, right? Somebody who's kind of like falling behind. And we always have this, this picture of, of Peter as, as an individual who fails. But what we see here is a step for Peter's development. Again, Peter was getting ready to be the rock. Uh, Peter was the foundation, a man uh, imperfect uh, like us, probably um, uh, most, most likely a little bit more mature spiritually 
than us, than the average individual on earth, but it's still not a perfect spirit, not an angelic spirit, a spirit that has this prejudice, 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 uh, who has these uh, weaknesses, uh, who has these moments of wavering, that spirit becomes the rock of Christianity. And uh, we see here in John, that's when, um, uh, in John chapter 1, verses 40 and 42, that's when Jesus calls him when he meets uh, Simon, uh, Peter and his brother, and he says, uh, and Jesus looks at, at Peter and says, hey, you are Simon. You are your Simon Barjonas. Um, his name was, actually, Peter's name was not Peter. Peter's name was Simon Barjonas, uh, Simon the son of Jonas. So he says, Peter, you're Simon Barjonas, Simon, Simon, Simon the son of Jonas, but you'll be called Cephas. And in Aramaic, Cephas means rock. And then later was translated uh, as Peter, which is uh, the Greek version. So we see here that, again, in all his experiences, Peter was getting ready to become this foundation. And interestingly enough, he's getting ready to become the foundation by failing, by, by realizing his own, no, but not only failing, but realizing, failing, but realizing his own shortcomings. And uh, whenever we see him going through these different experiences, uh, for instance, the, the most famous one is the denial of Jesus. He denied when Jesus was being, um, or had been arrested, and he was uh, um, waiting to, uh, had been arrested, and he was uh, waiting to be seen by the high priests. Uh, so Peter was there. Peter was in, in, the, in the patio uh, of the house of the, high, of the high priest. And there was a crowd. And then three times they asked him, hey, you know, are you with Jesus? And he denies three times. Uh, with all fairness, uh, Jesus had 12 direct, direct disciples. Out of those 12, when he was arrested, everybody ran away. Everybody, I mean, everybody was hiding. The only two disciples who were not hiding were John. And uh, John went to uh, pretty much to, to um, alert the women, basically Mary, uh, his mother, and uh, uh, Mary Magdalene. And, um, but Peter was the one who stayed. And in the book, uh, uh, Boa Nova, Good News, um, which is not in English yet, but hopefully it will be soon by uh, Umberto de Campos. So there is this, all this anguish. There's a very interesting, very in-depth ex, uh, explanation of what uh, Peter is going through and all the anguish that he feels to be in a situation in which um, there's nothing he can do. Uh, to help Jesus, and of course realize how fallible he was by denying Jesus three times. But again, everything was a learning. Everything, um, those, whenever we fail, we should see those as an opportunity, opportunities for us to realize in what points can we get better. We see another passage here, again, when, when he draws the sword and he smotes the high priest's servant. Uh, his name was Malchus. In John chapter 18, verses, verse 12. So he, he, he heard Malchus. So we see again that uh, going back to the definition of faith, faith it remains calm, right? The faith is, 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 uh, uh, does not resort to violence. So again, here again, Peter uh, is in a situation in which he's learning about himself. He's learning about his own shortcomings. So again, that doesn't mean, again, that Peter was a failure. Uh, but on the other hand, it, it displays that he was human. Again, uh, Peter was not uh, a pure uh, spirit. Um, he was a spirit, again, struggling like us. Uh, he was not uh, an angelic spirit. Uh, some, he was not part of the, the, the group of angelic spirits, the group of high spirits that were working with Jesus since the creation of the of earth he was again a spirit that um, still was, was working with his humanity however jesus saw the potential in him to see great things and jesus of course was right about him 
So again, whenever we believe that we failed, whenever we believe that, hey, you know, I've been studying about all these great things all my life about spiritism for so many years and I still make all those mistakes. So just let's just think about, uh, about Peter and about this, this spirit who uh, at some point, just like us, had to struggle um, with his own imperfections but also in the, in the end, who have a, had a chance, who at some point was able to do great things as well. So again, this is the, 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 uh, the inspiration that, that Peter brings to us is again, the potential that we all have, despite our shortcomings, that is still do great things. Now, the third aspect that I'd like to, to mention here, it is very interesting and it is a bit subtle in the story, it is the point of trust in others, have faith in others. And there is a, a, um, an aspect here that it is understood in the story. It is a fact that in the boat, who did we have in the boat? We have the disciples. We have 12 individuals who had a combination of skills. So Andrew, Peter, James, and John, uh, James and John were the sons of ZBD. They worked uh, in the fishing industry. Uh, basically, um, James and John were also businessmen. They used to help his father in the business. So they were, they, they were fishermen, but they, they had like, a, like fishermen, but have like a, a business acumen. Um, Thomas, Nathaniel, and Philip were also uh, fishermen as well. Uh, Matthew, on the other hand, who, who was called uh, Levi in Luke, he was a tax collector. So he was, uh, for him to be at that position, that means that he had a high level of education um, to be in that particular function. Now, another character here who was also on the boat, right, There's, uh, was Simon the Zealot. And uh, a zealot, uh, again, this is not um, this is not Simon uh, Peter. It is Simon the zealot, and pretty much a zealot is someone who is engaged in political in, in politics and in anarchy. And at the time, that would be someone who would be in uh, who would uh, be attempting or be working towards overthrowing the Roman government. So it's possible that uh, that Simon the Zealot he was some kind of could have been some kind of politician or even some sort of a revolutionary. There is no um, there isn't a whole lot of description about the the professions of some of the other disciples like Bartholomew, uh, uh, Thomas, Thaddeus, or James, uh, the son of Alphaeus. There is no uh, description of what they did. And interesting enough, also there's no description of what Judas did, but uh, he was, uh, at the time, for the group of the 12, he was a treasurer. So again, he was um, not sure if he was highly educated like, uh, like Matthew. However, he was somebody who would at least be, have some good organizational skills and, um, and some good math skills as well to be the treasurer, to be trusted in that position. So an interesting point now, is that what we see here, we see a diverse group of 12 individuals in a boat with some very diverse skill sets who are faced together in an extreme adverse condition. I mean, make no mistake, um, they're in the middle of a huge lake. They are, it is pretty much a, a life and death uh, situation that they are facing and um, believe it or not, they have to rely on each other. They have to help out each other. They have to, in their different skills, uh, I'm not sure what Judas would be doing at a time or Matthew would be doing or Simon the Zealot, uh, what he would be doing. But the, the bottom line is, it doesn't matter. They had to somehow try to work together to survive through the night. So this is a very common theme in our lives because a lot of times, very, very often, we face adversity and we, but we are surrounded by people who are totally different from us. 
and uh, those uh, those circumstances they they serve uh, to help uh, to teach us to pull together um, as a team and whatever that team might be. And the same way that if you're if you're in a boat with uh, a couple of, of individuals who are fishermen, but then you have a tax collector, you have a revolutionary, you have the treasurer. Um, and some other people that you don't know, uh, we don't know what skills they had. But again, whatever skills people had, they had to put that to work to, to go through that rough situation. A lot of times, uh, that's a very, again, very common theme in our lives. Not always, we, sometimes we wish we had the dream team around us, the, our dream team in our families, our dream team in workplaces, in a circle of friends. But that's not all the case. I mean, uh, actually, that's rarely the case. And um, we have to go through difficult times and try to, to work uh, with one another. And these, these circumstances that, that what they force us to do, they force us to nourish the trust that we have to develop in our, in our brothers and sisters. Um, and also they allow us, they teach us the importance of others to trust on us, to rely on us. There's a book that I like a lot. It's called The Speed of Trust. Uh, of all the non-spiritist books, it is a, a book that I highly recommend. It is by Stephen Covey, who is not the same Steve Covey who wrote The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. This is his son, Stephen Covey. And he talks about that. He mentions to us that whenever we are in an environment of trust, uh, things just flow so much better uh, for our performance. Our, the way we communicate, the way we interact just works uh, just works better. Things just, um, just run so much smoothly. So again, as we, we, we learn how to, in those certain difficult times, they, they create this, the, the trust. They help us develop the trust on those people who are around us. I, I dare say, in my opinion, that that was kind of like another one of those uh, coaching moments that Jesus offered his disciples. He, they would have to, to, at some point, pull together and, um, and lay the foundations of, of his, his teachings for, for posterity. But to do that, they have to, to develop this trust in one and the trust in one another. Um, and that reverberates with what the spirit of trust, uh, the spirit, I'm sorry, the spirit of truth uh, once uh, told us, he told us that as spiritists, we have to first of all learn how to uh, love one another, uh, educate ourselves, right? Uh, love one another, uh, one an another, and educate ourselves. So, in other words, uh, help nourish nourish this, the trust that we need to have between um, between us and others. And at the same time, also get ourselves more knowledgeable, uh, educate ourselves, be, uh, become better qualified so others can trust us. Not always from a competence, not always, always from uh, an intellectual standpoint, but especially from a moral st um, uh, standpoint as well. I'd like also to mention that as much as, as we trust others, there's always the, the risk that others will not uh, come through for us. Uh, and like um, John mentions, in, John again mentions in chapter 15, verse 13, greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. So we have to, under uh, to understand that we're going to trust people, but just like us, people are imperfect like us, right? So they're going to make mistakes the same way that Jesus trusted Peter and Peter several times, Peter uh, fell short. He never lost faith in Peter. He, and, and, and again, despite his, uh, his displays of pride, arrogance, intemperance, uh, uh, lack of faith, you know, the list goes on. I mean, we, um, and again, that's why Peter is such an important figure, not so much because 
not so much because he was a perfect spirit, because Peter was not a perfect spirit, but because his imperfections, they are, again, they inspire us and they show us that, hey, the same way that um, Jesus trusted Peter and he fell short, the same way that Jesus trusts us, Jesus loves us, even though we're going to uh, fall short as well. Uh, but the good, good news is that, again, uh, progress is a universal law. Progress, it is our destiny. Perfection is our destiny. So um, the, even the most vile person that we, we have to deal with, one day that individual uh, will reach perfection. Um, and the same thing about us as well. Even uh, despite our shortcomings, one day we are going to reach perfection. Going back to question 540, 540 in the Spirit's book, uh, the clarification from the Spirit is that everything is linked together in nature, from the primitive Adam to the archangel, who also began as an Adam. So we see here that, again, even something amazing, even some, some, like an archangel or a very high, uh, even a pure spirit, some, at some point that pure spirit had a humble beginning. So not, let's not uh, lose faith uh, in ourselves. Let's not lose faith in, in humanity because all of us are in this boat together. All of us are in a process of reaching perfection. Uh, I'd like to finalize here um, with a very short uh, slide uh, that I have, if it's, if it's okay to, um, to show my last slide here. So I'd like to, to summarize our talk uh, this morning with a, a few points that are, uh, I think are important for us to understand. So the first of all, uh, in summary, right? When the things will get tough, believe me, the life on, on, on Earth and on, in spirit, on planets like Earth, it's supposed to be, it's supposed to be challenging. If it's uh, if it's not challenging, if our lives are not challenged, that means that we're just taking, we're having a, a short break because as we go through our challenges, we learn and we become better. However, when things get tough, let's not forget to pray. Let's not forget to ask for help. Uh, just like when Peter was in trouble, when he fell in the water, you know, the seas were rough, the winds were strong. Um, he asked for help and he got the help. So let's not forget that recourse resource that we have and believe but also believe in your own potential i, I mean nobody's perfect right uh, but believe in you believe in the things you do be self-aware of your good things of course our shortcomings we we show ourselves we show our true selves at all times we struggle with our shortcomings but we also have lots of positive things so let's have the the let us believe in our potential to be good Let's be, uh, believe in our potential to, to, to be our best in, in the in adversity. And uh, trust, trust those who are in the same boat on the same boat as you, in the same boat as you. So again, trust others as well. Um, uh, seeing the, that circle of friends, who are the people who, who can help you? And also see how people can trust you, see how you can be of help to others as well. Um, do not lose focus in Jesus. Again, there was the, the big issue that Peter had at, at, the, at the moment is that the moment he stopped focusing on Jesus, the moment he stopped focusing on the divine or something better, he, he fell in the water. So again, let's not lose focus of our values. Let's not lose focus of the good things that we learn in the tough times because that's going to keep us above water. That's going to keep us uh, being the best um that we can be and the last point here you know the last uh, um uh, last point i'd like to mention is that no matter how bad things are right now the winds will calm down uh eventually and uh, i apologize for my little typo here but the, the winds will calm down eventually things will get better uh we've been through you know in our e even in our short uh existences here on earth of uh 40 50 60 70 80 100 years that's you know in our eternity as eternal spirits our life on earth is very short but in our short experience we've seen that over and over again things get very very bad but at some point 
the the sea calms down the winds don't don't blow so hard and again things will you will be okay things will uh, will turn out uh, to be all right Thank you for the opportunity. It's been, uh, uh, as always, great to be here and uh, um, to learn as we we prepare for these uh, lectures. And yeah, let's see what kind of questions do we have. Hey, Brad. Thank you so very much, Glacio, uh, for providing us uh, with this edifying and encouraging uh, presentation on faith and trust, uh, which is important in how we live, uh, act, and think. Uh, so at this moment, we will open for comments and questions from the audience. Uh, and our first, hi, Glossio. Great material on faith. I feel that faith is so difficult to develop or be maintained during hard trials because of the opposing forces, especially fear, mistrust, doubt, that are more easily powered by people, all media around us. How to succeed in avoiding these negative forces? It, it brings to to mind that old uh, the old tale of the of the two wolves, uh, and uh, uh, you have two wolves. You know the analogy is that you have two wolves inside of you one uh, of goodness and the other one which you call of evil so and they are always struggling uh which are they are always fighting each other and it boils down to and the question is which one which one is going to prevail right is the the, the wolf or wolf of goodness or the wolf of, of the evil and the the answer is which one you're going to feed Right, which one you're going to, which one you're going to allow to grow stronger? We are surrounded. It is part of our experience to be surrounded by. Uh, it is part of our experience on Earth, on planets like Earth, to be surrounded by negativity. Uh, we talk about the media, we talk about social media, but I mean, ever since you know, since ancient times. Uh, we've been exposed to negativity. We've been exposed to to um, peer pressure uh, on Earth, and again, it's part of our experience. But again, it is it is up to us to overcome to to um, to, to to overcome that kind of influence. It's kind of us. Um, we see all the negativity, um, and again, we talk about the media, all the negativity we see. But also, it is important for us to look for the goodness as well. To look, uh, even in, in situations, in, 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 in tragic situations that we see on earth, uh, we sometimes focus on, oh my gosh, so many victims got hurt. Let's think about all those people who are out there helping, all those people who, who, who did something to assist others as well. We always see those, uh, those hidden figures, those people who, who uh, we stand out in the crowd. And even in the moments of adversity, they do something good. Again, we, it's part of our experience to have, to have this on earth, to have this, uh, these external experiences. Um, it's funny because um, we talk so much about uh, spiritual interference, uh, how much the, 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 oh my God, the lower spirits are around us, how much they, they try to influence us. But bottom line is, uh, they're only going to, both incarnate and disincarnate spirits are only going to influence us and affect us and impact us if we allow them to, if we create the right conditions for that. I'm not going to say, I'm not saying it's easy because then um, it, will make, it will make no sense. But it, 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 the most part of the thing is there's the journey and the learning that we experience. Thank you very much, Valsio. Uh and which is more important, uh, faith is not only the belief, but is the cons constant knowledge uh, which spiritism scientifically rationalizes. So not only the belief, so they, they go together. The, the, the beauty of, of spiritism is that they, they go hand in hand. Uh, I believe because um, I see a God that is very logical. I see a God who created amazing laws of the universe. And uh, the laws of the universe, they're so complex 
that a lot of times we attribute things by chance. Sometimes some people can say, oh my God, the universe was formed by, um, by chance and, and the, right, the right conditions were created and for things to happen. But we understand that there is this God that has all these amazing laws and, um, and, and this, this gives us a better faith, a better comfort, as opposed to just saying, hey, you believe because you have to. You believe that there's a God because we see his presence in nature. Uh, just right now at, at CERN, they have found additional subparticles, subquarks. And then you can think, oh, my God, where's God? Like, no, God is right there. God, you know, you have a God that is so amazing that has created this, uh, that every time we look into nature, there's something new for us to, to learn and to absorb. So the same way that we have the God that has the, the, has the equilibrium on nature, his equilibrium on the universe from, from the largest galaxies to the, to the subatomical particles, to the subquark, the same way we can see, well, if there is all this balance, there is balance in my life as well. There's something better for me. So seeing nature, seeing God's presence in nature, God's uh, laws, how they work, everything so harmonized, that gives us this sense of security, this sense of harmony, this sense of calm. And at the same time, having this, the prospect of becoming uh, better people as well, uh, having this prospect that no matter how many mistakes I make, uh, at some point in time, I'm going to be a perfect soul. I'm going to reach perfection. That also gives us all our comfort. So, um, and why do I believe in, in, in that I reach perfection? Because I see that in nature. My mind sees evolution. My mind sees development in everything. So it, this gives me comfort. This gives me strength. So I would say they both they both go hand in hand. They uh, I would not even say that they are complementary. I'll say they are part of the same of the same equation. Comfort and strength are good companions together, definitely. Uh, so our next question is: How do we make certain that our faith trust is not blind faith? That is a, a very, um, I got, uh, we got to go back to Kardec, right? Kardec mentions that, uh, that faith that the, uh, he was talking about the belief, the belief that does not stand the, the, the test of time, that is blind faith. So the, as I see, um, I got to be, be looking to myself and see, hey, in my belief, going through the test of times am i as i learn do i still am i still certain of what i have right and um and especially the test of time not only from an intellectual but especially on a moral standpoint as well am i going through situations and i'm going to apply my faith in the in the correct way so having uh, having this introspective, having uh, looking into ourselves and seeing every situation, uh, I'm, I just go through this rough sea. I just when I've been through, a, um, I'm saying hypothetically, um, if somebody's going through a tough situation, as you go through that situation and you look back and you do like what would be called the lessons learned, you look back and you say, how did I, I act? Did I act? In, did I use? Did I exercise my faith as a, as a spiritist, as a Catholic, as, as regardless, evangelical? Did I use my faith, right? So I'm rationalizing, and not only that, um, is my faith progressing as well? As spiritists, believe it or not, we're taught uh, we're taught to to question things and to analyze things. Kardec himself said, hey, if, um, if spiritism goes against science, follow science, right? So, so as we go through that, we understand, hey, is my faith is not my blind faith. My faith is, is, um, is reasonable faith as well. And again, th that goes back to the experience uh, of Peter making mistakes, but learning from those mistakes, making, making mistakes and, and seeing how I can get better. Uh, through my experiences. Very, very good points you raised. Thank you.
Sure. So uh, we have a comment. Uh, would love to hear your thoughts on asking for help from those in your boat when you're not necessarily looking for how to fix the winds or your reaction to it. Not necessarily looking for how to fix the winds or your reaction to it. So it's kind of like saying, hey, you're not, you're, you're asking for the others when you're not, when it's kind of like when the others in your boat, so you ask for help for the others in your boat, right? For them to be helped. Uh, so um, getting out of the analogy, right? Uh, when we're in a situation and there's nothing we can do for others, we always have the chance to, to help. Always have a chance to pray. We, all of us have free will. And as we are going through experiences together, not everybody, not everybody's gonna be on the same page, and not everybody's gonna think like us, and not everybody's going to be trying to, to fix like fix the winds or solve the, the problems, right? A lot of times the, the problems they just there's nothing we can do. We just go we have to go through the, the rough situation. So praying uh, for others is always a way to help. Again, we cannot influence others. Um, all of us are all of us have our free will, and that free will extends on what we believe in, on what uh, how we act. And um, the the very least thing I can do is to pray for those pray for those around me and, and take the liberty to pray for myself, for myself and ask for wisdom, ask for, for strength, ask for clarity so that uh, we can go through that situation together in the best way possible. Again, we cannot, uh, like the old saying um, goes, right? I, I cannot, uh, I cannot, we can never change the wind, but we can always redirect the sail um, in the analogy of a sailboat. So I cannot always change the situation, but I can change how I, um, how I react at least. And the, the power of prayer, it gives, my, gives me this strength, this, this gives me, gives, can give me and those around me clarity, especially in those moments, because when we're going through, through a rough, uh, rough times, a lot of times we, it starts to get personal. Instead, you know, when the level of stress goes up very high, instead of trying to help one another, it's trying to, to, instead of trying to communicate, we, we create blocks of communication. We, we create a, a, a animosity. So again, the, the, the prayer, it helps us break those barriers and at least, uh, if not solve the situation immediately, at least harmonize or, or um, harmonize our interaction with one another again as we go if we're going through a situation together there's a lesson that we have to learn together there's something that there's an opportunity for growth that we're going to experience together so not to rely just on ourselves but to reach out to others in trust interest yeah in spiritual right. friends i mean we're surrounded we have uh, again just like um uh that's why i like this passage so this passage so so much i mean uh Sometimes we're in, in, in rough, we're in a difficult situation and uh, reach out to our spiritual friends. I mean, the, the, the problem might be not be solved immediately. And it's another point as well, right? A lot of times there's no problem, right? Sometimes we create the problems and by not having the, the, cl the clarity, we don't see that, hey, there's no problem. Everything's fine, right? And, uh, but sometimes, you know, um, Asking for help from the spiritual friends and, and ask them for wisdom to calm, um, to harmonize, right? And that's a, uh, that's where where the gospel, for instance, if we're talking about a family issue, gospel at home is so important. That moment, that those thirty minutes, one hour, um, one once a week, even if it's just one once a week, twice a week, regardless. I mean, that moment in which we're together, praying together, reflecting together, it it does help. Uh, it does help a lot. Uh, under those circumstances. Good advice. Good suggestion, Glacia. Thank you. Uh, our next question. If a friend or a stranger betrays our trust, how do we renew or maintain our faith in that person as Jesus did? So uh, Jesus is different from us, right? Jesus has this, this uh, vision 
ahead of time. So, I mean, he, he has this, uh, Jesus was, uh, was not only an incredible scientist, but he was, he was an, an incredible psychologist. So he, he knew a lot of things about a lot of traces uh, about his disciples. And he, he knew Peter. He knew Peter had his shortcomings. Peter was every you know, if you go down the checklist, Peter was had all has, has pride, arrogance, he, he he was vain, he had so many different things, but Jesus saw the potential. In the same way, also, we gotta see in people the potential and the good things as well. Now, with that said. Uh, if somebody betrays my trust, what truly happened there? Because uh, um, in the book, uh, Boa Nova, again, I'm referring to it again, good news. Unfortunately, it is not in English. I, I hope that they translate the book to English very soon. But um, uh, there is there's something very interesting saying there that goes, that goes like this, that um, people, people are more often um, weak than wicked right people are more often weak than wicked so what happened why did that friend betray me i mean so uh was he weak right and if he was weak i have to understand the circumstances right of what that happened um i mean was it a bad tendency um so think about the circumstances of what happened right um now if somebody has a consistent story of letting us down we should not uh, um become enemies with that person we gotta like jesus said present the other the other side of your face meaning not desire what's bad but also i mean we we have to protect ourselves as well protect ourselves and protect our loved ones and um and uh, be careful you know uh, like uh, I like I going back. I'm going on a going on a tangent here. Uh, Ronald Reagan once said, "You know, trust but verify." Right. So it's kind of like say, "Hey, I'm not going to have animosity to that person, but I, I'm going to be cautious as to not give that individual at least um, individual other you know possibilities to create problems for me as well. Whenever I can extend a hand to that individual." But again, understand that, hey, it might be that the individual is weak, right? Is a weakness. The same way that I'm, I'm, weak, I'm weak and, and I, I uh, betray, I might betray someone's trust at some time. Um, that individual might as well. So with that in mind, it, it's just be cautious, right? And uh, not desire anything bad to that person, not create an animosity to that person, but verify at, in what kind of limits uh, I can create not to um not to 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 run into any issues in the future and again there's two sides of the story i mean if, if somebody's a true friend i can i can sit down with a person and, and have a conversation say hey you betrayed me you let me down what's going on and listen um to the other person's side i mean it, I, i'm trying to oversimplify a very a very complex situation which is relationships uh, but that'll be in a nutshell verify what's going on um, create, you know, uh, uh, verify the side of the person if happened or kind of weakness has led to that, and if necessary, create the the put it put it in place the 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 proper um, uh, the uh, the proper procedures so that um, I'm also protected and my family doesn't get hurt. Good points. Good points. Uh, so. Let's see. Oh, we have one other comment. Um, I'm so grateful to Spiritism for demystifying Jesus' miracles through science, bringing a complete uh, different perspective to religion and faith. Your thoughts, please. I think this comment is related to the previous question about faith, uh, about rational faith. And of course, each one of us on earth, we're at different levels of understanding. Uh, and, and that applies to faith as well. And, um, and the way I see it, I respect a whole lot more a God that, that created laws of the universe. And the universe runs through those laws. 
And he can do incredible things by applying those laws. So to me, it's very, uh, I have a lot more respect than that to, to a God like that. It, it just opens my mind. Uh, a God that created a whole universe. I mean, we, we, we've seen so little of the universe so far. Our galaxy is 160,000 billion, year, billion years long. So when I think of a, of a creator that established laws that govern uh, the universe, like a vast and complex universe like that, that just gives me so much more respect for that God. And it gives me also, gives me a sense of, um, of security, uh, a sense of peace as well, because it makes me understand that my life is, there are laws, there's, there's justifications for what happens to me. And if I'm going through a situation, regardless of that situation, there is a, a, there's a, a, a logical reason for that. The same way I cannot understand the universe, I cannot, um, we understand very little of the universe. It's very hard for us to understand at this point, especially if I'm going through a, a tough time, why and, and what's the justification. But the bottom line is, as I believe in, in a very logical, very rational uh, God and a very special and very, very intelligent divinity, I can um, have more comfort and say, understand that, hey, that same intelligence, that same, that same order applies to my life, even if sometimes things seem to be chaotic. Thank you uh, very, very much, uh, Glossio. And wow. uh, our appreciation to everyone, uh, who tuned in today uh, for today's Spiritist Talk Live. And those who have been following uh, our weekly Spiritist Talk series. Before we close our live today, uh, I would like to remind everyone of the United States Spiritist Federation virtual course, Initiation into Spiritism, uh, which is provided free of charge on Sundays at 10 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. It is a self-paced course for those who would like to learn or review the basic principles of spiritism published by Alan Kardec in 1857. Please, please avail yourself of this great learning opportunity by visiting the course page on the USSF website and to receive uh, reminders about the course by email. Glacio, uh, before we close the live, would you please uh, do the honor and offer us a prayer? Sure, by all means. Um, we have a next talk last, last next week, right? Uh, is it Marcelo Neto uh, of Free Wales, Roberto? Nice. Oh, that's a great one. Marcelo is a, is a, great, uh, is a great guy. I'm pretty sure he's going to be a great lecturer. At any, um, so at this time, um, let's uh, let's go into our like Jesus mentioned. Let's go in in our in our quiet room and let's uh, reflect. Whatever way we prefer, if we prefer to close our eyes, what really matters is that at this time we connect with the divine. We connect with our spiritual friends. And all we have to do is thank for all the great teachings that Jesus left for us. All the great examples that we see in the gospel. We also thank for all the, the great uh, elucidation that spiritism provides to us this enhanced way to look at God, to look at the universe, this, uh, the possibility to look beyond our physical realm and understand that there is so much more and that we are so much more. Understand that despite all of our mistakes, despite all of our shortcomings, we are destined for perfection. Despite all of our tears, that we are destined to achieve pure happiness at some point. 
We ask for the wisdom to apply in our lives everything that, that Spiritism teaches us, the teachings of Jesus, and all of those who came before us and who left us so many great lectures. We also ask for strength, especially strength so that we can apply, which is not always easy, apply our moral values in our decisions, in our actions. May God's peace be with us during our week that uh, starts. And uh, again, may we have the inspiration during our tough moments, during our moments of rough sea, to see that there is, there is a master plan in our lives and that in the end, everything is going to be okay. So be it. So be it. Thank you, Colossio. And wishing everyone a calming and mindful weekend and week ahead. Thank you very much for joining.